Brinecliff goes back to basically two land transactions that took place in 1686. Those of you who know that early period of American history know that there is some question as to just what the attitude was of Native Americans and when they were engaged in a land transaction, uh, what did that really mean? Were they really intending to turn over rights to property? There's a lot written about that with regard to the uh, transaction involving what is now the uh, island of Manhattan. Um, but similar concepts would have applied here as well. But you had, as I said, two transactions, uh, both uh, signed by, uh, first was by Cora Key, uh, pretty much, and um, the, uh, uh, and Aaron Key. And that was with uh, three Dutchmen from Kingston, Hartson, Elton, and Rusa, names that you still see over in Ulster County. Um, and that transaction was a rather substantial one, estimated around 2,000 acres. But, and then there was a second transaction involving the Kips with uh, the Indians, Native Americans involved there, were uh, three by the name of uh, Calicoon, uh, Ankeny, and uh, Panamatan. And that property went up to where, uh, right on the river to this day, is a farm referred to uh, that has had the name Ankeny Farm for a good number of years. Uh, and speaking of farms, very few people, even who've lived in uh, this area for a good number of years, are not aware really of the significance of the farms that existed here in Rhinebeck and the sophistication of the uh, cattle industry here. There, there was an auction at the Anthony Farms in the 1960s. Uh, they sold the, uh, much of their stock and belongings and moved out to South Dakota. One of the people who, uh, when, when they had international stock exhibitions in the Midwest, in, in Chicago, uh, it was Catherine Losey and Jim Leachman, both here from Rhinebeck. Catherine Losey was the last resident of the Palatine Farmstead. Um, and it was Catherine who would ride the uh, trucks that carried the cattle out to the exposition of Jim Leachman, who organized all of that. Uh, Leachman family is, is now out in uh, Montana. The, uh, <clears throat> and Catherine passed away, sadly, in, in the year 2000. Uh, but Anthony Farms had belonged to a family by the name of Ryan, uh, who was a state senator uh, from this area. And at that time, Anthony Farms included uh, what is today Grassmere. Um, it included uh, over on Route 9G, uh, Buttonwood Farms. It, it was a massive operation that's since been subdivided. Um, were those three separate locations, or were they all contiguous? It was all, no, they were not contiguous. Is that um, a lot of them? No. Um, but they, you know, it was under one ownership. And, uh, so we've got, we've got these two transactions in 1686, but the agreements between Indians and individual Dutchmen meant very little. Uh, because even though it was primarily the Dutch that were operating, in these land transactions, it was entirely Dutch. Uh, <clears throat> Kip family was also based in Kingston, but moved there from New Amsterdam. Uh, you know, the English were really, this was an English colony at that time, and had been since the English had taken over Manhattan Island from the Dutch some years, decades before, in the 1640s. Uh, so even though English law prevailed, Nonetheless, there was a, and because English law prevailed, you had to get a patent. And what that meant was a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of delay. You had to send those documents to be reviewed by folks in Albany, uh, at that time Fort Orange. Uh, there, really, at that time, there were three settlements in this colony. There was New Amsterdam, which, which had been renamed New York, 
There was Fort Orange, which would be renamed Albany, and there was Esopus across the river from here. Um, and in order for, now the Dutch ideas play a part here because the Dutch recognized that it's one thing to lay claim to land, but the Dutch position was that those claims are meaningless if you don't have somebody from your family that physically settles there. So it was very important to them to honor this patent by actually having somebody over here on this side of the river, somewhere on those 2,200 acres. Well, the somewhere on those 2,200 acres is a spot that if you come down Line Cliff Road and you pass the Butcher Boys, uh, which, which used to be the bus garage out there on Ryan Cliff Road heading down here beyond your left, uh, the next piece of property has a little, uh, one of those New York State historic markers, and that is the Dick Beekman Hermans site, uh, where a house was built by uh, Henry Kip in 1700. And to this day, now that structure um, was the first structure built by a white man on this uh, side of the river in, Dutchess, in what is now Dutchess County, with the exception of a couple down that had preceded them just by a few years down in the uh, Fishkill area, uh, Madame Brett's homestead, if any of you ever been down in that neck of the woods. Um, but this was, uh, this was established soon thereafter. And that remained there until, uh, actually about almost exactly 100 years ago, uh, a fire devastated the place. The remains are still there. Actually, the property belongs to the Rhinebeck Historical Society, and I'm hoping that it, someday some serious archaeology will take place at that site, because it really is a very important site. Not just because of the age of the house, and not just because FDR found it fascinating enough to go there and fit, have people fish through the place, find the lintel, put it up in the Rhinebeck Post Office, and that lintel is there today, a big piece of slate that has uh, 1700 HKAK, Hendrik Kip, on it, yeah, <coughs> Kip, his wife. Uh, but it's more important because of the families who lived there. Uh, it eventually went from the Kip family to somebody by the name of uh, <coughs> Hendrik, uh, well, Hendrik Kip wound up selling it, um, and by, what was the year, uh, 1726, uh, it was in the possession of Colonel Henry Beekman, Jr. Uh, the Beekmans had been in Kingston. Uh, the father of, of Henry Beekman, also Henry Beekman, um, was a judge in Kingston, uh, prominent in, in that settlement at that time. Um, and Colonel Henry Beekman Jr. lived on that site until 1776. Uh, what's important is that one of his children, Margaret Beekman, marries Judge Robert Livingston. And uh, they moved to Claremont. Um, and uh, fascinated, if any of you have not been to Claremont, you ought to go up there great place to learn about the history of the Livingston family. Um, but they had nine children. Uh, and those nine children, where would they go? Almost all of them came back here to Rhinebeck. Um, we start out with Janet Livingston, who marries a fellow by the name of Richard Montgomery, who's in the military, gets killed right at the beginning of the, you know, he's storming Quebec decided he had to be out at the front of his troops and gets killed. Um, so that, that, it's that branch of the family that built uh, Grasmere, uh, but as soon as Janet's husband dies, I mean, she built it, she wanted it built for him, uh, but they never occupied it. Uh, she winds up mourning going up to building uh, Montgomery Place and staying there for the rest of her life and not remarrying. Uh, <laughs> another uh, 
daughter is Alida. I always thought it was Alida, A-L-I-D-A, but Wint Aldrich has corrected me. <laughs> it's pronounced Alida. Um, and she marries John Armstrong, another important character, um, and hence Rothby. Uh, and those <coughs> remain in the family uh, with some iterations to this day. Uh, another daughter is Margaret. Uh, Margaret marries uh, Thomas Tillotson. Thomas Tillotson was Surgeon General to General George Washington and lived uh, Washington when he would come up here would visit with Thomas Tillotson uh, and that's the property part of which is uh, Linwood uh, today owned by the uh, sister sisters of the Ursuline uh, sisters. And uh, <clears throat> another daughter, Catherine, marries uh, Reverend Freeborn Garrison, very important in Methodism in the United States. And uh, their property is uh, Wildercliff, um, south of uh, Wilderstein um, River. Um, another daughter, Gertrude, marries a fellow by the name of Morgan Lewis. Morgan Lewis was Chief Justice of the State of New York. Um, and Morgan Lewis had title to that portion of Rhinebeck that uh, was south of what Janet Livingston Montgomery owned pretty much <coughs> what is the north half of the village of Rhinebeck to this day. And the south half, uh, well, actually below Morgan Lewis didn't own any property that today is in the village, but south of the village boundary down to where the Hyde Park boundary is, about where Belvedere, or formerly Fallen Health Manor, where there's a creek that divides uh, the town of Rhinebeck and town of Hyde Park today, that was all property belonging to Morgan Lewis. And uh, one of the most interesting documents that we have at the Rhinebeck Historical Society is a map dating from 1802 that was kept by, it was done at the behest of Morgan Lewis to keep a record of who all the property owners, not the property, he was the property owner, but who all of his tenants were. Uh, and it's, it has the names of all the tenants, uh, shows uh, those cases where they had subtenants, uh, and it's a, uh, it's a map about, about two thirds the size of uh, this screen. Uh, but very important in our being able to trace uh, family history of who owned what properties. Um, and eventually the daughter of Gertrude and Morgan Lewis uh, marries Maturin Livingston, one of her cousins, uh, and they wind up establishing a place that was known as Ellerslie, just south of here. So all of this out of the Kit Beekman Hermont's house. Um, and you have people who play a very important part in the history of the country, and that originated here. Um, and speaking of Ellerslie, um, that eventually would transfer from Maturin Livingston and his wife to Levi Morton after having gone through somebody named William Kelly, after whom this street is named, that this library is on. Um, and this, and let's talk about this library for a moment. Uh, this is the Morton Memorial Library, and it's really, you know, it's not the Levi Morton Memorial Library, it's the <coughs> Lena Morton Memorial Library. Lena was the daughter of Levi Morton and had died in uh, 1905 uh, in France. Uh, Morton had remarried a second time, had been through a number of tragedies. His first wife, uh, Lucy Kimball, had died in, in Newport, Rhode Island at the age of 34 in 1871. Uh, they had had a ch one child, Carrie, who had died in childbirth. All these individuals, by the way, are buried in the Morton section of the cemetery in Rhinebeck. Uh, and then Anna Livingston, the second wife, lived until 1918. Um, but Lewis Parsons was their, one of their children. He dies at the age of four months. 
Um, and then Lena um, dies at the age of 29 in 1905. And then the, uh, Morton decides that in her memory, he will build this library. The, uh, it's, it's interesting, also around the same time, he decides to make, Morton was one of the major benefactors for the Church of the Messiah in Rhinebeck and donated the uh, uh, organ that uh, became a very important instrument in the development of that church. The Church of the Messiah Choir is uh, one that was known uh, far and wide beyond Rhinebeck. Uh, <clears throat> so Levi was not into self-promotion. What, what was more important was being able to perform public service, and that was the intent of this room, actually, this building. Um, and it was very beautifully built. The oak paneling that you see here is original. The, uh, the library that's, that's uh, across the hallway here is really one of the few libraries in the county that still feels the way it would have in 1910. Um, there were a lot of performances that took place on this stage behind me. Um, and there were a lot of lectures that took place in this room. Uh, my guess is that the uh, family would be very happy to hear that the place is getting used uh, you know, for events like this. Um, if you have questions, ask me on the way out, and I'll meet you outside. Behind me here was the Episcopal School. What number? Um, it is on your map as, um, let me see, we are William Street. It's, no, I, it's lot number 46 on your map. 107? If you... Uh, you oh, no. 44. No, 40, 40. We, we have yeah. traveled southward on Kelly Street. And so you see at that intersection in the upper left-hand corner is a structure labeled as a school. So this was, it was a Sunday school tied to the Episcopal Church, which was located on the next piece of property towards the river. Um, and this structure originally was on that side of the street and was moved over here. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why, uh, but the, it's, it's rather unusual in its construction. It's an octagonal building, uh, you know, the three sides on, on either end and a stretched middle. Obviously today it's, it serves as a home and with some of the most beautiful landscaping here in Rhinecliff. Behind you on the other side of the street, if you look on your map, you'll see a piece of property with the name William Kelly next to it. Um, the, um, <clears throat> and that would have been the William Kelly who had owned Ellerslie, who had been also a, he didn't actually live in this house. Obviously the house has gone through quite a few uh, modifications uh, since this map was done in 1867. Um, but William Kelly would not actually have lived here, but would have owned the property. Uh, let's go down the street here. Okay. The building behind me was the Free Church of the Ascension. It was an Episcopal church. Uh, the roof, which is no longer there, was of shakes. Uh, it, it had a peak tower, a double uh, Gothic double gothic windows, and most of that burned. I mean, the gothic tower stood twice as tall as what is that entrance that remains. Um, and it was built here under Reverend Walsh in the 1860s. One of the, uh, Rutzen Supley, who was uh, another resident of, uh, he was a resident of Wilderstein, Supley family, own property in the middle of the village of Rhinebeck, uh, right where the Catholic Church is today. 
and Ratsensukli, uh, as a devoted Episcopalian, uh, <clears throat> had given land, that land, to the Episcopal Church in 1852. And um, they had, the Episcopalians in the town of Rhinebeck had been holding services in the Methodist Church and then in the Baptist Church uh, and wanted their own place and built their own place. Uh, and as I said, it's where the Catholic Church is today. Uh, what happened was you had quite a growth here, a large part of it attributable to the construction of the railroad and all the employees that were involved in that venture. Um, but the United States generally was growing by leaps and bounds in the 1850s and 1860s. And, uh, and it was just natural for more people to be in the area. And obviously, more of them were, you know, you had an increase in the population of Episcopalians living in this community and also in the southern part of Rhinebeck along Route 9. So the uh, Episcopalians in Rhinebeck figured they needed a couple of branch churches, at least chapels, and one of them was built uh, along Route 9, um, Hillside uh, Chapel, um, and that today is no longer a chapel. It's, uh, it actually had been an antiques business for a number of years and has been for sale for uh, a few years. Uh, big tarp over it, I don't know how much damage there is inside. Uh, but the other spin-off church was this one. Um, and it became, um, it became an important addition to the Episcopal Church. Now, if you look down the river, we're not going to head down that way. We're going in the opposite direction, but you'll notice a pile of dirt there. And actually, that's one of my most frustrating moments recently. Uh, you know, there, there had been a very tiny house on that property, and uh, the town planning board was prevailed upon to consider an application to demolish that structure uh, and asked for advice of a number of people, including David Miller and myself, uh, and we said, you know, it does look like that would be a structure that it would be very difficult to do anything with. Go ahead and grant approval. However, if you do that, the replacing structure ought to be in scale with those around it. And by in scale, what we meant was so that it didn't block the view of people uphill, so that it retained approximately the same size as the neighboring structures. And uh, you can judge for yourself. <laughs> Our next stop is gonna be uh, just up here, the Episcopal Church and for the Episcopal School, Sunday School. Um, it's Borden Batten, you see the gable roof, uh, symmetrical design with a central entrance. Um, you know, you've got <clears throat> four over four windows. It, at one time, there was a set of double doors there. They've been replaced. It's one of the few changes in the house. Uh, but they've done it in a manner that they've put the windows on either side and the uh, area up above. But it's, it's been uh, beautifully maintained and, and attractively landscaped and you've got this magnificent pool. The uh, uh, museum was very fortunate to be able to hold uh, progressive dinner on this site just a few years ago. It's really a magnificent place. So the pool is owned by the this is Butler Street on your map, and we're going to be heading up Butler Street in just a moment. Uh, this street was known as uh, Ryan's Hill. And for many years, and, and it's known as Ryan's Hill because uh, I think it's lot 717 on your maps there is located right across County Road 85, and that was uh, Ryan's property. Hi, are you going to join us? I forgot all about this until I heard you all out. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was Ryan's property, and Ryan and the kids would, for many years, this was a favorite tobogganing spot. 
because of the slope there. I, I guess there's been some flattening over the years, but uh, you know, you, you could get on a toboggan up there and, uh, right there and just go right over the cliff, I guess. Go swimming. Is this a pool here on the ground where the gazebo is? I have no idea. It looks like it has been. I, I don't know, Barbara. Okay, we're going to head up. Come on and join us. C compare, if you would, what is happening on this site with what you saw on Grinnell Street a few blocks away. Here's a house that's totally falling apart. I'm sure it was, has been and is proving to be extremely expensive to remake it but it has retained its original scale and has no different impact on its neighbors than it did prior to the work. And those of you who've spent time going by this house over the past few years have got to feel pretty good about the fact that this work is taking place here. They're doing a real nice job. Nice. Yeah. Pretty? We're, we're not going to go that far, but you will see at the edge of your map C.H. Uh, Russell House on this side of the road. And it would be a house or two behind this house right here. C.H. Um, Russell was a director of the Hudson River Railroad. And uh, I mean, to get there, we'd have to go up to the next left and go up a ways. Uh, and that's where uh, Cynthia Phillip lives today. It's a beautiful home, uh, outside as well as inside. Uh, and it was he who, in 1852, decided that the, this uh, area shouldn't be called Kippsburgen anymore. Uh, it had been called Kippsburgen for many years by the folks here because it was a Kipp family and many of their relatives that made up a big part of the population here and who had first settled here. Uh, <clears throat> but he thought it would be better to name it after the uh, farmer from whom the railroad had bought property, bless you, along the, uh, along the river. Uh, that farmer's name was Schatzel. So Mr. Russell said, hey, you know, we ought to call this Schatzelville. <laughs> well, his, the head of the New York Central, New York, and Hudson River Railroad was a man named Borman. Um, and James Borman, the, the president of the railroad, said, you know, <clears throat> Charles, I think Bormanville would really be <laughs> more apropos. Uh, so, you know, in a number of documents in that period, we have a reference to this area as Bormanville. That did not stick either. Uh, there was a builder who was brought up here by uh, Elizabeth Jones, who's the owner of uh, uh, an estate on the river just south of Wilderstein. And she wanted that estate built, brought up this fellow named George Veach from the city. He had just come over here from Ireland, was born in, in Ireland. And uh, <clears throat> he did the work for her and bought a piece of property where he built a house that we'll look at a little later. And uh, George Veach was looking for some kind of name for the area that would combine the idea of a river with the heights. And he said, how about Rhinecliff? And that's, that was the origin of the name that's, that's used uh, today. But uh, <clears throat> I, I don't think that Russell was too upset that Schatzelville never stuck because one of the things that Russell did <clears throat> was to buy a lot of property. And he was here early, and as one of the kingpins in the railroad, he knew what was coming, and he knew what the historic impact was of when railroads went anywhere. There was always a lot of political fighting as to where a railroad would actually be sited because everybody knew that property values would skyrocket and that people would want to be there. Uh, and that was even more the case in the 1850s than would be the case in the early 1900s, later 1900s, when there were other more effective, uh, other alternate forms of transportation. Uh, so let's head down this way to a uh, piece of property that belonged to the CHR. Wow. 
The uh, building on your right here is one of the, uh, in, in the Rhinebeck Central School District, uh, back before consolidation, there were 11 schools, 11 elementary schools. And this was the most solidly built of all of them. Most of them were, and are still there today, were wooden structures, not so here. In fact, you see uh, George Beach's uh, name up there. He was a designer of this building. Uh, again, you see the pointing that you saw on the Morton Library. Uh, you know, you see quite elegant decorative uh, features above the doors here. Um, and to this day, if you speak with uh, some of the older residents of Rhinebeck, Rhinecliff, uh, you'll still run into people who came here until the early 1950s for first, second, third, fourth the grades. There were four the classrooms the in this building. Uh, and the, uh, and this has been sold and was empty for quite a few years um, and was put up for sale by the Rhinebeck Central School District and bought by uh, somebody who converted it into uh, four condominium units and that's what it is today pardon yes lot number four lot number three rather if you look yeah. here you see the cemetery and then there's cross street and then below on this side of cross street is what had been the school lot it has been cut up into quite a few smaller lots if you look at today's property property tax records but it had been at one time one single large lot that had been uh, you know, lots number four, number three, number two, which is a cemetery lot that included the church. All of those had belonged to Charles Russell. <clears throat> so let's go up this way. Oh, that's cool. Energy. Oh, so which is your husband? Uh, in the lead in the orange. No, no, that's my, my husband. This is another building that was designed by George Beach and St. Joseph's Catholic Church, built in the uh, mid-1860s under Reverend Michael Scully. Um, if we go back to the late 1850s, um, at that time and into the early 1860s, if you were Catholic, and you lived on, in northern Dutchess County on this side of the river. And if you wanted to go to Mass, which in the Catholic Church, you need to go to Mass every once a week on Sundays. I don't know if they had services on Saturdays. On those. Well, they would have had Mass every day of the week. But you went over to Rondell, uh, which was not that difficult to do. In, in the late 1800s, uh, there were the Kingston, the, the Rondout Rhinecliff Ferry ran, did 26 runs a day, uh, and it cost 13 cents. That's in 1899. Uh, in the 1860s, it probably would have been comparable. But going over to Rondout was increasingly a problem, and it became apparent that they needed their own church on this side of the river. So <clears throat> Reverend Scully was dispatched over here to do something about it and bought a piece of land at the intersection of Mulberry and Livingston Streets in the village of Rhinebeck. 
There's no Catholic church. There's no church at that intersection today. So what happened? Well, uh, he's making plans with the congregation. They're having services actually in the Star Building, you know, which is the right next to where Foster's is today. Uh, <clears throat> and he's getting all this feedback from people here in Rhinecliffe saying, whoa, wait a minute. You got a lot of Catholics who've been working hard on the railroad, you know, who've decided to settle here, and they got to go several miles to Rhinebeck to go to church? Uh-uh. You need to build a church here. So Reverend Scully heard them. He sold the property in Rhinebeck. There was somebody by the name of George Rogers from Tivoli who makes a deal with, yes, Charles Russell, <laughs> buys six acres here, um, and they build a Catholic church. This was the mother Catholic church for Northern Dutchess County for quite a few years. It was from this church in the uh, very early 1900s that the Reverend uh, Scully's successor approached uh, the consistory of the Episcopal Church to see because the Episcopals had come into a few bucks uh, through the Astor and Morton connection and we're going to build a real church, uh, today's Church of the Messiah, and we're going to dump the one where they had been and was perfect for the Catholics because that was a big step up for them. And uh, so today's Church of the Good Shepherd was one of the spin-offs. Uh, before that, in 1870-something, um, actually both in Tivoli and Berrytown, there were Catholic churches established and they were under the aegis of the uh, priest. Who, uh, they were under the aegis of St. Joseph's Catholic Church. Um, and while there are only services here once a week on Sundays, actually the tables have been turned. Uh, whoever the priest is who is a, who's handling Good Shepherd, this is part of the parish and comes here uh, and does services uh, once a week here. Um, and many of the, this is the oldest part of the cemetery here on the right, but the cemetery, if you've never seen it, extends a good ways. I mean, it, it is using all of the original six acres. Uh, is the this, burial is still this taking place cemetery here. area, that's six acres? Yes. This whole area is six acres. That's what, what had been bought uh, from Charles Russell <coughs> by, uh, by Rod. <coughs> Michael? Yeah, Hill now, the street. And the reason is that Chatzel Avenue now dead ends and does not come straight uphill. <coughs> the, the building on your right here was uh, St. Joseph's Catholic School for Boys. Actually, one of the buildings that you passed, which is indicated on your map, I believe it's indicated on your map, was the parsonage for William Scully for, for the priest who uh, was at St. Joseph's Church. Then the next building down would be this one. Um, and this was run by Cornelius Scully, who was the brother of Reverend William Scully. Um, and the, uh, I think, Well, maybe they've removed the double doors. Uh, well, this had this had become a uh, a grocery store and, and had gone through a number of transitions. And today, obviously, it's a private residence. Um, but there were quite a few schools here in Rhinecliff. There are some properties that are low, on your map you'll see the initial CM right up near the upper left and those were, uh, <clears throat> there were four properties there and there was a boarding school located on that property. This was a boarding school as well as a school uh, to which kids could walk who lived here in the neighborhood. Um, but there was the Morton Road School which is south about three miles 
from here uh, at the intersection of Mill Road and Morton Road, which was used primarily by, it's actually a rather, it's, it's an older building than uh, the school we just passed. Uh, but that was a school that was attended by the children of families who worked on the various estates south of here, Wilderstein, the Morton Estate, the, um, the Jones Estate, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> there was also Cardinal Farley Military Academy and later Holy Cross on the Ellerslie property. Um, and then we had slightly north of here the Holiday Farm, which was a predecessor of the Astor Home for Children. Uh, Holiday Farm was established by uh, Levi Morton at the uh, around the turn of the century. Um, so none of those operates as a <coughs> school any longer. The other site that's important at this intersection is Caddy Corner across the road here. The Riverside uh, Methodist Church is a magnificently preserved uh, structure was built in 1859 as a result of a donation from uh, <clears throat> Mary Rutherford Gerritsen, the daughter of the Reverend Freeborn Gerritsen. Um, and Freeborn had come here originally in 1792 uh, to visit Thomas Tillotson. Uh, and I think I mentioned him before, lived in, in uh, the area where Linwood is today. Um, Freeborn married uh, Catherine Livingston and took up residence at Wildercliff, and then he built uh, the Methodist Church in Rhinebeck. Um, <clears throat> and the church had expanded so much by 1855 that uh, you know the Methodists decided there was a need for uh, this additional chapel. Um, so. Uh, the, the beauty of this building, if you look at the roof, which the, the current owners are uh, uh, Carol DeSarum and uh, Raymond Erickson, and <clears throat> they have, you, you'll notice the, I mean, that's not just a slate roof. Uh, those tiles are of different colors. The, that polychrome design and the flower design on the darker tiles uh, is extremely tricky to do. Uh, you've got magnificent buttresses there on, on the north and south side. Those uh, arched windows are very delicately pointed with the, uh, you know, you've got brick around them. And then you've got the bell tower up there and actually uh, Carol and Ray are trying to make some decisions on how, uh, trying to get somebody who's willing to uh, go up there and do some uh, do some work on that bell tower. Um, and then on the side of the church facing the river, um, one of the most important events in this area right after the end of the First World War was a stained glass window that was put on that side of the church uh, in memory of one of the residents of this area who died and, and served in the country during the First World War. Um, and they've also done an enormous amount of work inside. This is their residence here um, when, they're, when they're here in Rhinebeck. <clears throat> we'll uh, take a, you, you can see some work being done. We're gonna turn right here, but before we do that, uh, take a look at some of the copper work being done on the windows at that house down below. Uh, that was the parsonage for this particular church. And, um, I know. Cliff Railroad Station is not a surprise to anybody. Um, it did involve uh, demolition of a good number of structures uh, that are on this 1867 map. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, originally, I mean, this building did not get put up until it actually was in stages. 1904 was the initial construction at this site, and then it was between 1910 and 1914 that most of the work uh, that you see today took place here. I mean, you see some Spanish colonial feature here with, with the roof tile, uh, and then this buff-colored brick is rather unusual. Uh, 
the uh, <clears throat> um, person who was uh, responsible for the, the architects here were Warren and Wetmore, uh, the same architects uh, who built Grand Central Station, designed Grand Central Station. Uh, and actually a lot of the redesign, I don't know how many of you are aware, but a lot of the redesign of Grand Central Station was done by a uh, firm in New York City and a lot of the grunt work was actually done by uh, principal at the time, well, principal more recently of Rhinebeck Architecture and Planning, Lou Turpin, who, uh, if you ever catch him in Grand Central Station, he will give you a lengthy tour of everything that uh, got changed down there and restored to its original glory. Uh, but this station, uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's originally the railroad station was further south here uh, and closer to where the Rhinecliff Hotel is today uh, <clears throat> and the uh, it's it's the railroad really as I mentioned earlier that's responsible more than any other single factor for the growth of Rhinecliff both the construction process of the railroad brought a lot of people to live here and ever since then the fact that there is a railroad here uh, has been responsible for a lot of traffic to and from Rhinecliff. Um, folks in Kingston, if they want to get to New York City, come over here. Um, and <clears throat> it's, it's also been responsible for a lot of the connection between Rhinebeck and Rhinecliff. Um, the, the railroad reached Poughkeepsie by 1849 and was here. It reached uh, Slate Dock slightly north of here by October 1851. Um, so a lot of the, uh, the, you'll note that by 18, that Beers map, this, this copy of a map that you have is an 1867 map by Beers and uh, was done uh, for him by a surveyor. Um, actually the results of the survey and those lot numbers are from the, uh, from the original survey of the entire hamlet um, and there was a lot of speculation on the property here and, and Russell was one of the principal speculators uh, and uh, they all apparently did pretty well uh, you, you know when I'm talking about dates of construction of the various churches here uh, a lot of those are from the mid 1800s 1850s 1860s 1870s uh, even though this expansion of the railroad station is 40 years after that. Uh, this is a magnificent site out here looking at the river. Um, I mean, I don't see, uh, despite the ivy and the chain link fence uh, and other things to keep us from falling over the cliff, um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, though, that the railroad and the river were the scene, more so then than today, of a lot of tragedy. Uh, if you, I, I was looking through some of the <clears throat> uh, back part of Marriages and Deaths, a, a book put together by Art Kelly, um, Marriages and Deaths from the Rhinebeck Gazette. September 17, 1870, Patrick Brady, employee of the Hudson River Railroad, died yesterday having been struck by a train Thursday near Rhinecliff. October 23, 1873, Gazette. Patrick O'Shea, not expected to live after a train passed over his legs last Tuesday. He was sleeping on the switch near the freight house. Right down here. <clears throat> it's indicated on your map there. May 18, 1872, no first name, last name is Davis. Conductor of a, dra of a gravel train was killed on Friday in Rhinecliff when he fell and three cars rolled over him. <laughs> April 2, 1892, John Lawler found dead at the dock. He may have been murdered by Tim Conlon. <laughs> you know, the Perhaps. newspaper didn't worry in those days about making those kinds of allegations. Uh, and then Stephen Mann just gave me this the other day from the January 20, 1860. Uh, you know, this is in the middle of winter when the river would have been frozen over. A party of over 20 persons were crossing the river on the ice in a sleigh 
When the ice gave way, sleigh went down, carrying with it eight of the passengers. The others escaped. Um, so there were a lot of awful times that, you know, that took place right here. Even though on a, on a day like today, it's it's really magnificent. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of beauty here. And, uh, a lot of neat stuff going on taking place on the river. So why don't we head south? On your maps, uh, we are at we're at Corning. We're at Duchess Terrace and Corning Street, and you will notice on your maps that Duchess Terrace continues, right? <laughs> well, it did. Um, and do you notice whose house it is at the corner of behind me here? Uh, this was George Beach's home. Um, and he had appropriately enough uh, picked a spot overlooking the river here. And uh, you can kind of figure out why he would call it Rhine Cliff. Uh, but he did have, but this did continue uh, straight down for another block, but not anymore. So we're going to head down over uh, to your left. This structure at 11 Charles Street is a beautiful restoration of an older, not very fancy structure. Uh, belongs to uh, Richard Kopasinski. Is, is one of the people who I understand has involved in restoring the structure across the street. That building was the uh, Methodist Church Parsonage. It is not on the 1867 map. You, you just see a blank there under lot 32. Um, but it was built in 1888. It's a uh, simple residence that retains most of its early detailing. If you look at the, uh, if we can come down the street here a bit. Yeah, it's a beautiful You don't, it's funny, you know, walking, then you see all these places yeah, yeah. where if you're driving, you don't even see them. There's that uh, decorative facade and the uh, porch there. And notice the curve of the window in the upper story. Uh, nothing at all fancy or pretentious. Uh, it was built as a parsonage for the minister of, of the church next door. Um, you know, you've got, well, you, you can see they're all sorts of problems with with the structure it's the original uh, tin roof uh, you know over a hundred and twenty years old those, those tin roofs uh, are pretty tough um, so okay we're gonna go down the street a bit further on your left as you're looking up the street uh, on your map is lot 86 uh, and today that's the post office, also known as zip code 12574. Uh, I don't know if any of you read about town, but there was an article in there uh, in uh, their spring issue called 12574 and it was by Francis Sandiford and it was about this post office. Um, and it was originally established, actually not on this site, but in 1867, uh, and if you look on your maps, at the very top of the map um, <clears throat> is uh, lot 74 at the north end of Charles Street, and it was located in a business, um, was the original post office, and it's, it's continuing to struggle to stay alive, but this is, this is a place where the residents of Rhinecliff meet their neighbors, and it's, uh, as Francis Sandiford points out, it's not a level 20 post office the way the U.S. government rates those. 
uh, like the Rhinebeck Post Office is at level 20, the higher the activity, the, the higher the number, it's a, this is a level 13 and it's perpetually closer to the uh, chopping block. Um, at one time, the, uh, there was a postmaster here in Rhinecliff, actually for 40 years, her name was Harriet Kuhn, and at that time, the post office was located in the round shaped building uh, that we just walked by. Um, <clears throat> and uh, if you uh, if you had the wrong zip code on a piece of mail, oh, well. she would she would make the correction for you. But uh, <laughs> the, the next time you came in, she would let you know about it. You better not make that error a second time. Um, but that, that's, uh, those of you who know Alan Kuhn, that was his mom, Harriet Talmadge Kuhn. And you see the name yeah. Talmadge on your map on one of the structures on the south end of Rhinecliff over in that direction. 180. And that was her family. Um, so if you look further up the street on your left, um, right behind the fire hydrant there, is a building that had been a, the Union Hotel. And uh, that was a very busy place in the latter half of the 19th century. Um, the square cupola up on the roof is, is a unique and very attractive feature of that house. Um, and you can, uh, you know, one of the other attractive features of the house, which has nothing to do with the construction of it, uh, is that there's a, very tasteful, very restful Asian style garden in the rear. And actually, if you walk down Orchard Street to the left there, past the firehouse, look on your right, you will see a portion of that house. I mean, it's, you know, open fence there. You can look in there. That was part of a, uh, a house and garden tour uh, just uh, a couple of years ago. The, uh, and the person who owns that house is also the individual who owns uh, China Rose down the street, so he doesn't have a very far commute. Um, the uh, Rankliff Volunteer Fire Company, a uh, great spot for soup, and a very uh, solidly built building. No, I'm serious about the soup. I don't know if any of you have ever been in there. You know, they have these days when they sell the homemade soup. They don't put signs out in too many places because they have no problem selling. So, uh, uh, you you kind of have to go into the post office. Uh -huh. I know everything. Uh, so, <clears throat> all right. On your, it, right in front of you here, yeah, it's labeled as, it's lot 85 belonging to J.A. O'Brien. This was built in 1863 by George Beach. Um, you, you can see the decorative feature up there at the very top above those upper windows is very similar to what you've seen in a couple of other buildings. Um, you know, and actually around the corner you would have seen on the side of the building a place where there had been a sign. Um, this says we, we have a photograph from the very late 1800s of this structure and you can see that, read that sign very clearly. It was Ostrom and Cornwell dry goods, um, but it has been repainted over with other owners and actually operated as a dry goods and grocery store, it went through various changes over the years, but, uh, and, you know, to the credit of the current owner, he has, he, she, I don't know who the current owner is, has retained uh, that storefront and really has the appearance of what it looks like in those 1880 photographs. Uh, but is it a residence behind it the is a It is a residence. Okay. Yes. Uh, so this is the... I think it very briefly operated as an antique business. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what the owner's... The owner is happy with it as it is. And <laughs> so am I. <laughs> Glad it hasn't changed. Is there a bar here, Patty's Bar? Uh, at one time, uh, there had been a bar located that? right here. Yes, my daughter had uh, a bar. Yeah, I, uh, I had a few beers there once in another life. Uh, Which building yeah. was it? You mean it's not down? It's, it's no longer here. Oh, is it between the two? Yeah. yeah. Oh. The bar is still in Rhinebeck. 
at the, at the yeah. restaurant. Patty, Patty, Patty was operating that bar for, for many years. Uh, so if we look downhill now, on your uh, uh, right, where there currently is a parking lot, that's lot 62 and 63 on your map, that had been a lumber yard. Um, and then on that same lot, you see a tiny building with the name Thomas Kelly or T. Kelly next to it. Uh, and that had served as a barber shop, was later a candy store. And the, if you continue down the hill, the last building there where you see a traffic cone uh, is where uh, it, it's listed as lot number 12 there belonging to uh, John McElroy. Um, at the time this map was made, it was a saloon. Uh, it's now a uh, restaurant that, uh, as I said, belongs to uh, Bruce Murphy, who also owns that beautiful house at the other end of Chatsel Avenue. Um, you know, if we turn around a moment, <clears throat> and actually because of the time of, if, if this was winter, you know, you wouldn't have the leaves of the tree blocking the view. But where that car is parked at the end of Chatsel Avenue, there, there was no dead end. Chatsel Avenue went straight uphill to the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church, uh, I, don't, I don't think you can see any of it. Well, you can just barely see a small section of it behind the trees, but it, it really is an imposing view over the, the hamlet. Um, and one of the, after the street was dead ended, there were still steps up to the church. And we've done interviews with residents of Rhinecliff, uh, and one of the stories that's told by one of the people interviewed is about how uh, at Christmas time, the congregation of the church on Christmas Eve, midnight mass, would, before midnight mass, would stand on the steps. And this person remembers when it was snowing that evening coming through Rhinecliff and hearing this angelic chorus thinking am I dreaming or what and it was the chorus of St. Joseph Catholic Church and apparently they did that I don't know when it stopped uh, I talked to somebody who had lived here in the 1950s and she didn't remember it but um, in any event that was that was really one of the neat things steps that, there? That, the steps have, you know, there are railroad ties there that have largely disintegrated. Um, but so turning around again and looking downhill, um, <clears throat> the um, then if we look at on the left side of the street, you see a white building with columns in front. Uh, that is lot 59 on that corner, uh, and that had been Tom Dyer's store. And that particular general store uh, competed with this one on your right, uh, Ostrom and Cornwell, and before that, J.A. O'Brien. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an indication of how busy things were here in Rhinecliff that, uh, you know, eventually these two stores went out of business, and it turned out that the only place where you could buy any food or any necessary items was very costly. Hotel. Uh, it's actually the Rhinecliff Hotel. If you've never been inside, is much larger. Bless you. Thank you. Than it actually <coughs> appears. You, you can see that L shape on the map, and it's built into the side of the hill there. So it, it really doesn't. Uh, um, you know, it, it, if you get up close to it, it doesn't really give you a sense of how much room there is inside or how well the space is used, but... That's been a hotel for over 100 years? Well, mm -hmm. it's not on a map of 1850, but it does appear on an 1858 mm -hmm. map, so we know it was built somewhere in between those years. Um, and, yeah, on this 1867 map, it's it's there. Uh, yes, it's been, a, it's been a hotel for that much time. Wow. Um, you know, it's... Uh, in, the, in this particular 1867 map, the owner is William Crandall, 
In a later map, it's shown as belonging to a Mrs. McElroy. Ooh, and it was McElroy on that map who owned the property across the street. So apparently there was coming to be a McElroy monopoly on the hotel business. Uh, <clears throat> but the proximity, you know, it's the closest hotel. If you're getting off the train and you haven't made a reservation, that's where you're likely to stop first. Uh, and that helped it stay in business. Uh, it had competition from the Union Hotel up here, which was apparently a little bit more fancy spot, a little quieter spot. Uh, you had a lot of the occupants of these hotels were people called drummers, and drummers were basically traveling salesmen. And the, the notion comes from the fact that, you know, you'd go up the street and to wake up people in the house and let them know you were there, you'd have a small drum. And Tap on it. I mean, that had, up business. had not been in effect for many years, but uh, that's that's the origin of that term, and that's what they still call these traveling salesmen, who are most of the occupants of these hotels and saloons. Um, and uh, you know, by the 1970s, Rhinecliff had become a residential hotel, and when I taught out in, at the uh, Rhinecliff School District down at Holy Cross, the, uh, one of my fellow teachers was Bob Donaldson. Bob lived in the Rhinecliff Hotel uh, in the early 70s for about a year. And his student, he would start his classes in the morning by telling his students about what he had heard through the walls of his room <laughs> the night before. And, uh, even one-tenth of those stories were just uh -huh. unbelievably amusing. Uh, and <clears throat> the hotel also gained some notoriety in the 60s, 70s, 1960s, 70s, and 80s because it was a place where bands could get their start. Uh, there were a lot of bands that played the Rhinecliff yeah. Hotel, and I've uh, my, my daughter lives in Portland, Oregon, and one of the people she knows had uh, played in a band on the West Coast in the 70s, but had done his first gig at the Rhinecliff Hotel. It was just really weird. Um, but the, uh, you know, the third floor, the late closing hours, the uh, cheap liquor, the, uh, the fact that the local constable sometimes looked the other way, uh, probably was both responsible for some of what happened there to help the place grow, but it was also what was responsible ultimately for the law cracking down and closing the place several times and Ed Kaibas being in a position where he really couldn't continue to make some of the changes that were necessary to operate responsibly. And fortunately, James Chapman has done a really nice job uh, restoring the place. Thank you for Thank joining you. me on the tour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.